correct? Did Todd, or did he, did he focus on this at all? The ET partitioning part? Good. We haven't heard this yet. Um, so there's the water balance equation dealing with precipitation and runoff, deep drainage, D, and evapotranspiration, and a change in storage. The evapotranspiration component of that is quite large, uh, particularly in semi-arid and arid zones like you see here in southeastern Arizona. This is a picture um, near Cochi in Cochise County of the San Pedro River flowing north out of Mexico from the left to the, from the right to the left and drains into the Gila River in central Arizona. Um, nice riparian area there and we've been doing a lot of work. We have done a lot of work over the years focusing on water balance and eco-hydrological um, processes in this basin. And quite a bit of the precipitation, 80 or 90 percent, returns back to the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. And in such a system, you can imagine that with all that bare landscape, that the evaporation part is quite significant. And it is in these arid and semi-arid zones. And that's part of evapotranspiration, the loss of water back to the atmosphere that doesn't get channeled through plants. And it's not involved with photosynthesis leading to primary productivity. And in agricultural systems, water managers think of that as a wasteful loss. So we're interested in these natural landscapes, but in terms of water management in agriculture, this partitioning of E versus T becomes really important um, if you're using precious water supplies to, to grow crops in arid areas. Um, because the more that's lost via evaporation is the less that goes into your crop that leads to some production of some crop yield. Okay? So this is a really important thing and the agricultural community has really done a lot of work to figure out how to partition these fluxes. Most of the measurements that we have, micrometeorological measurements like eddy covariance methods, um, they don't partition these fluxes, although they're extremely important. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we do that. And this is um, just to say what I've already said, but give you a nice little cartoon. Um, precipitation can leave the system via transpiration or evaporation and depending on how those components respond to human activities, changes in atmospheric chemistry, climate warming, uh, disturbance of the vegetation, changes in land use cover, um, those components are likely to respond differently. Right? And so knowing that will allow us to better predict how much runoff and deep drainage um, is likely to occur across these landscapes, as well as allow us to predict effects on productivity, as Jim was alluding to in, for the Amazon Basin. There are numerous examples and ways in which you can use isotopes to partition these fluxes. And I'm not going to talk about all these methods. I'm going to focus a little bit on the uh, number, th uh, which, oh, number two, the Keeling plot approach, which you've heard something about. And then spend a little bit of time talking about a recent paper by Jasheko that um, attempts to use lakes as an integrator. The isotope ratio value of lakes as an integrator of evaporation and transpiration partitioning. But if you're interested in any of these other kind of methods, um, I can certainly provide some references for you um, that I um, have available. Okay, so let's focus on that second approach, the Keeling plot approach. And you already have heard about this. I think Dave Bowling introduced you to the Keeling plot approach. It's just a, um, a mixing relationship between a source, the land surface, and the background well mixed atmosphere. You can use isotopes to uh, characterize the isotope ratio value of the flux coming off the source using this mixing relationship, the Keeling plot. Um, and this just shows you how we develop that from uh, rearranging the mass balance equations um, for the concentration and the isotope ratios of uh, a sample that you collect within above the vegetation and um, use that to determine um, using a linear relationship the intercept value which is the isotope ratio value of the source and once you have that you can then attribute the um, the, the various uh, inputs to that source whether it be transpiration or evaporation you can partition that if you know the isotope ratio value of the total evapotranspiration, which is kind of a hard parameter to get at. So that's what we're interested in, in doing. And, um, and so we go out into the vegetation and we sample air from a profile um, within the canopy and above the canopy. 
And from that set of measurements, um, one can find covariation between the concentration of water vapor in your sample and the isotope ratio value of, of your sample, showing this isotope mixing relationship between the background air and that that's fluxing off the surface. So we collect samples in this boundary layer of the vegetation, and if all of the evaporation or evapotranspiration coming off the landscape were due to evaporation off the soil or to um, open and exposed pools of water, um, you're likely to have a relationship that follows that bottom dash line because that has a strong isotope effect. The evaporation coming off those open surfaces, soils and lakes and pools of water um, fractionates the isotopes and the lighter isotopes preferentially are released into the atmosphere concentrating the heavy isotopes in the liquid phase from the evaporation surface. So that happens in soils, happens in lakes, happens in water that collects on the canopy. But as Jason um, pointed out, and I didn't plant that question, good question, the effect of transpiration um, is quite different because plants are likely not fractionating water uh, for the most part when they take it up to the roots. There might be some examples of halophytes that do do that. Um, but over the right time scale, the water that's moving up through a tree um, is isotopically unfractionated as it's leaving the transpiration signal. And so it retains the isotope ratio value of the water that the plant is using. And so because of those different effects, the isotope ratio signals between evaporation and transpiration are quite distinctive. And so if you build a Keeling plot relationship with multiple collections of samples in this um, system, one can fit a line through that, and if you meet a number of assumptions, I think even Elise talked about yesterday, um, you get a nice straight line, and the intercept represents the isotope ratio value of the total evapotranspiration flux, and it's going to be probably somewhere in between those two in-member values. And you can use a simple in-member mixing model to calculate the proportion of ET that's transpiration and evaporation. Does that all make sense? Really simple Keeling plot approach. Same thing's done with CO2 fluxes, other kinds of fluxes where you have uh, a flux source mixing with the atmosphere. So we've applied this technique, um, and there's some assumptions that you can read about. I'm not going to talk about them right now. We've applied this, well, I'm going to talk about them. I'm sorry. I have some slides that make me talk about them. Follow the slides. So one of the important assumptions um, has to do with this transpiration signal, because we would hope that over the time period of our measurement that the isotope ratio value of these signals aren't changing, right? If, you have, if it takes 30 minutes to an hour to collect all the samples that are necessary to, to do this partitioning, you don't want the isotope ratio value of each of those independent fluxes to be shifting on you. Otherwise, you'll get just a big clouded mess. And one thing that can influence uh, this is the dynamic relationship of wa leaf water enrichment in the non-steady state, which I think probably Todd spoke to you a bit about. For the most part, we assume over the right time scale, more than a day, that the isotope ratio of water moving through the tree is the same as the isotope ratio leaving the tree. It's conservation of mass, right? It has to be. Everything going in is going to leave, and so if you measure over the right time scale, those values are going to be the same. So if you just collect some stem water value like you did in the first week of this class, that's a good estimate of the transpiration isotope ratio. Except that the transpiration um, isoflux from the surface of leaves is quite dynamic because it's not in steady state. There's some residence time of water in the leaf. It turns over slowly, and so it's not necessarily um, at steady state with the changing environmental conditions over the day that shape the fractionation patterns and the water isotope ratio leaving the leaf. And this can be important for uh, species that have large um, water reservoirs in their leaves, like conifers. Um, or, you know, you can imagine a succulent plant where the water moving into this big succulent leaf is going to have a really slow turnover rate and it might not ever really reach a steady state with the atmospheric and um, boundary conditions that are influencing fractionation from the surface of that, of that leaf. But for other plants, um, the steady state processes are quite rapid and then as the conditions change over the day, the, the plants are generally in, in steady state. Here's an example of some conifers that we measured in Wyoming showing um, very significant non-steady state transpiration conditions. What I'm showing here is the um, predicted oxygen isotope ratio value of transpired water coming off 
leaves of different canopy height on the left panel and coming off leaves of different ages within the same branch, noting that there are some differences with canopy height and with leaf age that relate to rates of transpiration, rates of water turnover in the leaf. But the main take home point is that only during a, a limited portion of the day does the isotope ratio value of the transpiration flux equal that of the water moving up through the plant. So if you're measuring and collecting samples from the stem of the plant to characterize the isotope ratio of transpiration, um, that's fine over the right time scale, but at really short time scales, you may have this non-steady state issue that you have to be aware of, okay? So just be aware of that. And is it important? Um, one of my former PhD students, Enrico Yepes, looked at this in a grassland system. And what he did is he, we had this experimental grassland plots um, with one grass species growing, a C4 grass, Aragrostis, in these plots. And he put a big chamber over these plots and then measured the dynamic change of the water vapor concentration and isotope ratio in the chamber air in these closed chambers over time and developed a Keeling plot relationship of the water vapor as it built up inside those chambers. And he um, did this over different times of the day and then he um, made some predictions of the transpiration versus evapotranspiration ratio based on the Keeling plot relationships, um, modeling with a steady state assumption and without a steady state assumption. And you can note that in the morning time with rapid changes in the environment, the plants were probably transpiring at non-steady state, um, meaning that the water coming off the plant was not in isotopic steady state with the water moving into the plant. But later in the afternoon, those steady state conditions um, were apparent and the uh, steady state or the non-steady state model was um, similar to the, the simple model, Craig and Gordon relationship model for the evaporation flux. So all this is saying is that under some conditions you have to be aware of this non-steady state condition of transpiration to characterize that signal in these mixing relationships. But under other conditions you probably don't have to worry about it. Any questions about that? Yeah. So are there diurnal variations in the composition of the water coming in? You know, We've, we've looked at that and not, not really. Most studies just collect one sample at midday. A few studies have looked at real diurnal courses and the, the studies that have looked at these diurnal courses don't show much variability. You can predict that it might happen as the tension on the plant starts extracting water maybe from different soil reservoirs. But I suspect what's happening is there's enough sort of re, uh, reservoir of the plant transpiration um, pathway that it buffers out those really high diversity signals. Jim, do you have a comment about that? Yeah, the only time we ever observed it is when we had a monsoon. Mm -hmm. The shallow layer was dry, and it took a day or so for the uh, water to be taken up. So that was just a shifting source value, sure. rather than something that's happening with a constant source, and then maybe the plant switching back and forth between sources over the course of the day. Yeah, we've looked at this in woody plants in the desert, and we haven't seen any di diurnal variation, except for when you get a storm like that. So other, other things to be aware of about using these um, Keeling plot models, and that would violate assumption of a constant uh, signal that's necessary over the time course of the measurement. 